Hey, everybody. Brian, can you make uh, make me the host so I can share too? Oh, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for uh, those who are able to attend our question and answer forum regarding our back to school plan. My name is Jim Franchini. I'm the superintendent here in the school district. I'm joined tonight by our five principals, three at the elementary school, our middle school and our high school principal, our assistant superintendent for teaching and learning, uh, and our athletic director. Uh, so thank them for uh, taking time out to, to join me here tonight. Uh, we're going to go through a presentation for you that really mirrors the plan that we recently released. And then uh, we have some questions that have been received by our communication specialist that he will read and uh, we'll go over and direct them to the appropriate person. And then the uh, question answer section of the, of the Zoom is open. So you can put questions in there. And uh, Brian, who's our communication person, will be able to kind of summarize those, put them together for us, and uh, we'll respond to those the best we can as well. So again, his questions, he, he won't be reading questions word for word, but kind of summarizing and grouping them together. So if you don't hear your question read exactly as is, it's just because he's kind of trying to combine them in the interest of time. So again, thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna start with our, our presentation now as I'll share my screen. So the 2021-20 school back to school plan starts off with uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, no surprise here that we now know that the uh, leading public health prevention strategy to end this pandemic is the vaccine. And the district as a whole encourages all individuals who are eligible to receive the vaccine as soon as possible. As you probably are aware, remember the district has actually held some clinics. We held them at our middle school and our high school last year. Uh, we're having conversations now about doing another one. And certainly the vaccine is available in our county and in our community. So the vaccine is something we strongly encourage. And I think what's really important for our community here is there are different quarantine protocols in place for the those who are vaccinated versus those who are not. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later on. The district will continue to monitor community transmission, We're working very closely with our county department of health. Uh, the county department of health has been a fantastic partner for us during this, this time. We had a strong relationship with the county and the department of health prior to the pandemic, and that's only been strengthened during these, uh, during these tough times. Uh, I meet regularly with them at least once a week uh, with all the superintendents in our county, with the county health department, and 
the health and safety director from our BOCES, from Quest our BOCES. So we're in regular communication. And uh, again, we have a very strong relationship with them. And uh, that has been very beneficial during this time. And we certainly are encouraged by that and know that it will continue as we move forward. And with their help, we'll be able to monitor the positivity rates in our county and dive even deeper in terms of what is happening in our school district. So the term that you're probably gonna hear a lot and see a lot this year, if you haven't already, is a layered mitigation approach or layered mitigation strategies. And really what that is, is all the things that we've done in the past and will continue to do in an effort to keep our students and our, and our staff members safe here. Uh, the list is you know, all things I think we've seen before and heard before from the vaccine to the use of masks, uh, physical distancing, screening testing. You might've heard the term surveillance testing, it's kind of been now referred to as screening testing which is uh, having a certain percentage of our students and our staff members tested on a regular basis in order to kind of monitor the uh, level of, of, uh, of virus in our community. And that's done proactively and be random. Uh, we did that last year. We looked into doing that last year and having permission and we'll have parents giving consent to do that as we move forward. That process is currently uh, very much in uh, development, uh, very fluid right now. There's been money that's been distributed from the federal government down to the state government, down to the county, and our county department of health is working very closely with our BOCES and the BOCES with our school districts to develop a plan where we'll be able to implement the screening testing in our district. Uh, what we think will be very effective and uh, we hope will, will be uh, another strategy that will help to mitigate the, uh, the pandemic in our building. We'll continue to focus on improved ventilation, something that we did last year and we have uh, a little information coming that later on in our facility slide, uh, certainly an important thing. The hand washing and uh, respiratory etiquette, certainly important as well. Uh, we really wanna encourage people to stay home and get when they are sick and get tested. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we continue. Uh, we're obviously gonna continue contact tracing. Uh, at times people will be recommended to isolate or quarantine and we'll have a routine cleaning and disinfection all in place. So again, all these strategies together are kind of a layered mitigation approach. None of them are the magic uh, cure, the silver bullet. They are all things that if we do and do together and do well, we can really uh, think we can keep our, our students and our staff safe here. As you recall from last year, we were mandated to provide three forms of instruction and that was in our plan. We had a uh, in-person model, a hybrid model and a remote model. This year, we are not required to do that. Our district, along with, uh, quite honestly, all the districts that I'm aware of, are following uh, a strong belief uh, that in-person learning is the way to go. That's really been adopted by, you name it, every group out there from uh, science and, and scientist folks, the associations uh, representing our faculty, uh, the administrators, school boards, everyone is really fully on board with the importance of in-person learning. And as a district, we certainly, certainly support that and value that and believe in that. I think we did a pretty uh, remarkable job last year in our hybrid and our remote model, but there's nothing that takes the place or replaces in-person learning. So we are, are fully in on making our in-person learning model the best it can be. And uh, it's something we feel very strongly about and uh, we are excited to be able to offer it this year. Following the new governor's announcement that she's gonna be directing through the State Department of Health, a, a mask mandate, uh, we'll be following that here in our district. Masks will be required for all of our staff and students, and that's regardless of vaccination status. And we will follow the physical distancing of three feet where possible and when possible. And that's really in our classrooms and other areas of the buildings. Excuse me. Breaking that down, uh, physical education will have their three feet distancing. That's up for our indoor classrooms. Masks will be worn just like they are during other times during the school day. And as we did last year, our, our, our PE folks will prioritize outdoor activities uh, when the weather permits it. Uh, some changes in our music and how we're handling it this year based on the science. Uh, we've taken uh, the data that's out there, the science is out there, and three feet distances for aerosol emitting activities and that's for those engaged in singing, playing wind instruments, and play rehearsals that are held indoors. So we're going to go to three feet distancing there. Mass will be required for all of our students in band and orchestra and chorus. The exception, uh, which is logical, is for the students in band who play wind instruments. And those students playing wind instruments will utilize the bell covers, which we used in the past 
uh, on their instruments. And that again, is just to reduce the aerosol from circulating in an indoor space. Really, as we know now, as the science has evolved and our knowledge has evolved, that the virus is transmitted mostly through aerosol through the air and that we wanna make sure we're doing what we can to minimize that spread. In terms of sports and extracurricular activities, uh, we already have announced this and our, our season is actually underway already at the high school level. So our inter interscholastic sports will be offered to students this fall. Uh, we are going to test all of our student athletes who are playing a high risk sport that is football and volleyball for the fall. Uh, our student athletes and our coaches will be masked while they're indoors. And we aim to conduct our other extracurricular activities through the school year with the same masking and physical distancing guidelines. So we'll continue to do that. Um, the sports, as I said, are up and running. We are going to test all of our student athletes. That is uh, something that parents have to consent to in order for their child to play. And we're gonna start that testing once the school year begins and we have all of our uh, resources here available to us to be able to do that effectively. We really were among the leaders last year in testing our student athletes and uh, our, our nurses and our athletic director and our coaches and trainer did a fantastic job of, of doing it, doing it effectively and doing it uh, efficiently. So we are very uh, confident they'll be able to do this again, uh, expanding it down to the modified level. Last year, we didn't have those modified sports, so we'll be doing it both at the middle school and the high school level. Obviously, if we're going to have all our students in the building, it kind of uh, would lead you to believe that our transportation department needs to go back to uh, operating at full capacity. So we will be doing that. We'll continue mitigation strategies. We'll use seating charts in order to uh, have our contact tracing uh, be strong. We'll do cleaning and disinfecting. That'll be done daily. We've purchased a product through our BOCES that uh, sprays down the buses that'll be used um, when needed and as necessary. And a key here again, as we kind of talk through these, our ventilation, uh, our windows and our roof hatches will be open as much as possible to increase ventilation. And that is a big thing for us, obviously, to keep the air flowing on our buses, which will be operating at full capacity. Again, kind of following the same theme, if we're gonna be fully in person and uh, buses at capacity, that our cafeterias need to be used. Uh, we're gonna exercise appropriate physical distancing in those cafeterias and those eating areas. Uh, we'll do the best we can there when possible. We'll have our layered mitigation protocols that we've already referenced, the hand washing, the hand sanitizer before and after meals. We are gonna limit mask removal to the duration of eating. That is something that was reiterated in our call with the County Department of Health this week. Uh, it is very important from a uh, identification of close contacts that in the cafeteria, students limit their removal of their mask to the time that they're eating and we'll ask them to put their mask back on when they're done eating. Uh, our principals can talk a little bit more about their plans in the individual buildings as we had some questions come in about that. So we'll dive into that a little bit deeper. And of course, we'll be doing our cleaning in between lunch periods. Last year, we had a daily health screener and we took temperatures. Uh, the CDC guidance no longer recommends that, so we are not going through the temperature screenings and we are not going to be sending you uh, via email that daily questionnaire. Uh, in the end, I think what we learned from last year, it was not all that effective in identifying um, potential spread or cases. So it is something that all districts, as far as I know, have moved away from uh, per the CDC guidance. Contact tracing uh, and, and quarantine protocols. We're working very closely with the Quest R3 BOCES health and safety team. They are really experts in this. And of course, our county health department, I've already mentioned uh, that we view as a very strong partner. Uh, the next paragraph, we actually took word from word, word for word and quoted from the CDC guidance that people who are fully vaccinated do not need to quarantine after contact with someone who had COVID-19 unless they have symptoms. Uh, fully vaccinated people should get tested three to five days after an exposure, even if they do not have symptoms. They need to wear a mask indoors in public for 14 days following the exposure or until the test result comes back for them that is negative. Also, what we uh, have learned even since this slide, everything is very fluid, is those who are uh, close contacts who are vaccinated have to wear a mask indoors, but also uh, outdoors in public settings. So they'd have to wear, in that case, if they're in an outdoor PE class or if they're playing a fall sport, they would be masked if they're in that category as well. But really the key thing there is that you do not need to quarantine after contact with someone if you've had 
who some of us had COVID-19 if you are asymptomatic. And that's a big thing for both our students who want to be able to come into school and attend their classes, important for our student athletes who want to come in and be able to, able to participate in their practice and their games, important for our faculty and our staff and our administrators who are able to come to work. So that is a big thing and yet another reason that we are encouraging vaccination that uh, it really helps in terms of keeping our people here and in the building. Facilities, uh, we worked very hard last year to improve our ventilation and we will continue to do that. We're bringing fresh outdoor air in. We're gonna utilize opening doors and windows, uh, not to sacrifice the safety, of course. And we understand, of course, that as the weather gets colder, that becomes a bit harder, but we will continue to emphasize that. We'll have child safe fans. Uh, something that we did last year that we we're gonna continue doing is we're gonna be running our ventilation system uh, two hours in advance of the school day and two hours after at least and it could even go longer if there's activities in those rooms after the regular dismissal. So what we did last year was run those ventilation systems early in the morning before people got here, at the end of the day after people left to keep that fresh airflow coming in. Uh, we also went to last year uh, changing the frequency of how, um, how often we change our filters. We're gonna continue doing that. So the filters in the rooms will be changed and changed uh, as often as, as we need them. Anytime we have an exposure in a room, we change the filter immediately. Otherwise they're done uh, quarterly. So we'll keep those filters clean. Uh, we are running the highest MERV that we can with our ventilation system or with our unit ventilators. So that is important that we're continuing to do that. Um, and we're gonna rely on that ventilation. As I said, we know that the aerosol is, is the main way of uh, transmitting the disease, the virus. So we'll continue to, to emphasize that. We are offering a remote learning option. Uh, that is for those students that are medically unable to attend in person. We've done that survey for both K-5 and then 612. So we feel like we've gotten that information out there. People have responded, we have followed up uh, individually at times with people to answer questions. And we are working to get that full remote program fully underway. Uh, it's gonna be through our BOCES. Uh, looks like right now, probably a combination of Questar, which is our one that represents Rensselaer, Columbia, and Green Counties, and also Cap Region BOCES, which is the other side of the river in terms of the Capital District area. Um, so we will be working with those two programs to provide a fully remote program for our K-12 students. We really want to emphasize this part, especially without a screening tool or temperature checks, that we are asking people to be smart and be proactive and stay home if they're showing signs of any illness or disease. Uh, something that has become very clear as we've worked with the Department of Health this summer and, and quite honestly throughout the year last year and even before that is one of the main symptoms that we're seeing, especially with this Delta variant, is allergy-like symptoms. So people are getting runny noses, those type of things that we sometimes associate with allergies, and those are uh, uh, sometimes not allergies, but actually COVID-related. So we're asking people to just be um, proactive and to stay home when uh, they're concerned, when they're having symptoms. Uh, and that's really, really important, obviously, to keep us all safe. Uh, obviously, get tested when you have symptoms that are compatible with COVID-19. And uh, a very important last bullet there that students and staff should not report to school or work if they're awaiting test results. That guidance has um, remained consistent that if you are experiencing symptoms and you get tested, that you should stay home. We, we did have, unfortunately, many cases last year where test results were out and people came in and then found out they were positive. So, so please, if you're having symptoms, get tested. If you get tested, please stay home uh, if you are symptomatic so that uh, we know that you are taking care of yourself and also we know that you're not spreading anything until we know that you're negative. So that's the, the presentation which again mirrors the plan and the infographic. Hopefully you found the information in the plan to be uh, detailed and informative and the infographic to kind of be a one-stop, quick, easy uh, way to be able to refer to the stuff that is in the plan. And uh, with that, we'll rely on Brian, who's our communication person I mentioned earlier, who's going to go over the, some of the questions that have been asked and emailed to people and then I know We've opened up the uh, Q&A section as well, so folks can email or uh, type in their questions and Brian will filter through those and get those out to us as well. So Brian, what do you have for us? Sure, so we'll start out with a, a vaccine question. Will 
everyone eligible for the COVID vaccine in school be required to uh, to receive it? Uh, no, at, at, at this time, we are not mandating the vaccine. Um, as you know, in some cases, it was just approved by the FDA. Uh, we're waiting right now for New York State to act on that. We've been in contact with our attorney, with our folks at the DOH, and we're waiting for the state to provide further guidance on that in terms of what will be required and what will not be required in terms of the vaccine. The district, however, is not mandating that for employees at this time, nor uh, mandating it for students that are eligible. And are students allowed to remove their masks when they're sitting down and they're spaced uh, three feet apart? So we are going to ask our students to remain masked uh, while they're sitting down and, and, and socially distanced. We are going to have mask breaks. And what was clear through our DOH call is that um, the mask breaks to be done effectively should be no more than 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. So we've instructed our, you know, our principals who will message that down to the buildings that yes, we're encouraging mask breaks indoors and in classrooms, but we really wanna limit that to 15 minutes or less during a school day. And that's an effort to keep people from being identified as close contacts. Also be using uh, mask breaks outside, whether it's recess or you know, PE classes or whatever they can. So we'll be utilizing mask breaks, but in the classrooms, we're gonna ask uh, folks to stay masked. And will parents be allowed at in-school events again, such as uh, open houses or other community events? Yeah, you know, something that we've been saying a lot this year is we want 2021, at least here in the beginning, to look just like 2019 as much as possible but with masks and with social distancing. So our plan is to uh, allow our parents into the building. Uh, all of our principals are planning in-person open houses at this point. And we are looking to have events like we had in the past. We're looking to do things. Obviously we're trying to be smart. We're gonna do them outdoors when possible. Uh, and those events may look different. So maybe your open house won't be the entire school, but maybe we broken down by uh, grade level or teams or, or some kind of format like that. But we are looking to do things do things in person, uh, have parents in, have volunteers in. Uh, I think we'll ease into that. We're not looking to hop into having volunteers in our buildings, you know, the first day of school, the first week of school by any means, but we will try to phase those things in and provide more of what we would call a return to normalcy as best as we can while still keeping everyone safe. We have a couple uh, quarantine questions. What's the plan for students that will need to quarantine? So for quarantining, we are, we're going to provide instruction and I will let our principals kind of jump in and Matt, um, in terms of how we're gonna provide that instruction at each level. Uh, Matt, do you wanna give an overview maybe of how we're doing that? And then sure. uh, the principals can jump in about how you plan to provide instruction for the students in your buildings who uh, potentially could be quarantined. Thanks, Dr. Franchini. You know, as as uh, you mentioned earlier, we are uh, really uh, putting all our efforts into remote instruction. So, or I'm sorry, in-person instruction. So, therefore, remote is not something that uh, we have locally at Avril Park. We'll be using uh, BOCES to provide that. So, as a result, when a, a child is quarantined, we're going to follow a model that we used at our K-5 level last year. We're going to actually implement that K-12. Uh, where a, a child would receive work from their teachers uh, as, as if it were any uh, long-term illness and uh, they'll have the opportunity to stay up to date by getting that work on a daily basis. On top of that, at each level, there will be a person that will be available to communicate, contact the students on a daily basis as well. And again, that person or that system looks a little different at each one of the three levels. So I guess I'll let uh, Mr. Keyless, if you want to start at the high school and talk a little bit about what that might look like. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Layden. Um, for us at the high school, we're, we're going to ask that um, families please communicate with our school nurse um, should there be a situation where a student's quarantined. Um, from there, our nurse is going to reach out to um, the student's guidance counselor who is going to coordinate with uh, teachers um, that uh, the student has to go ahead and have them connect students with the work that they need. Um, we're going to continue to maintain Google Classrooms. 
um, for each of the courses at the high school. And we'll have a central landing page on the high school website where students and parents will be able to access um, those uh, classrooms for each of the teachers. The additional layer that we're going to add for the upcoming year is that um, we are going to have uh, Mrs. Wood, who is our support room teacher um, at the high school, reach out to quarantine students who are out for an extended period of time um, to connect with them for one block a day for some direct virtual support for the duration of the time that they're out. Um, so we'll be using a number of different strategies to keep our students engaged, but our objective is to make sure that they have what they need to continue on during a quarantine. Mr. Messi, you want to explain the middle school plan? Sure thing. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. It's uh, it's exciting to talk about the return of school because it means the return of our students. Um, and even though these maybe aren't the most exciting topics to talk about, we're glad to do it tonight. When we talk about making up work and students that are going to be absent due to quarantining, uh, it's important. I think Mr. Kukriles really did a great job emphasizing the point of communication with the nurse's office and the main office and making sure that we're in the loop in terms of what is going on with the student in terms of quarantining. Uh, we have a designated time in our building, uh, just called access period in the middle of the day, where students are gonna be able to check in through Google Meet with their teachers to be able to see what assignments and activities they may miss. They can get caught up on work as needed, get extra help and support as well. Uh, we also have a team landing page system that's been established and was used last year. So our seventh and eighth grade students are familiar with this and they'll be able to check in and see what activities and assignments are going on in the classroom as well as what uh, independent activities they may be able to accomplish uh, on their own. So uh, our basic plan is to check in each day during access. Uh, we're encouraging students to do that, again, prioritizing the communication. Uh, but we wanna really make sure that we, as a school, don't disincentivize kids staying home when they're ill. And that's important. And we appreciate the fact that families do that uh, when their child is exhibiting symptoms or when they need to quarantine. And finally, elementary, I don't know if uh, who drew the short straw wants to explain the, the, the plan, but if one of you wouldn't mind just talking us through it. Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, and again, I echo Mr. Messia's sentiments. We'd all do uh, that it's so great to engage with our community uh, once again, and we look forward to uh, in-person communication and contacts. Um, so at the elementary level, uh, we do have a plan in place uh, in which if a student is quarantined, you know, we do have a staff member in each building, uh, actually, who can make that daily contact uh, with a family. It would be at a certain time uh, because those, those individuals would have uh, other responsibilities. And that's in the event that the classroom teacher, uh, him or herself, uh, is not able to provide that direct communication on a daily basis. So uh, unlike uh, the high school where Mr. Keele said they would start with the nurse and go through the counseling center, uh, we anticipate going directly uh, between the classroom teacher and the family uh, in terms of how to how to um, keep that instruction going. And again, if, if it's not uh, going to happen synchronously, um, then we do have staff members uh, in place that can uh, that are able uh, in their schedule to touch base uh, on a daily basis with families. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of uh, what Mr. Simpson was saying. Uh, this year, uh, which is a little bit different from different times last year, uh, the adults that will be available will be from each building specifically. Um, so they should be adults that uh, students at our level and our uh, individual schools are familiar with. Um, and just to, to kind of finalize that, each individual building will be communicating out uh, the times that where this is available as well as the links uh, in order to be able to do this. So. It's a very similar plan to, to last year for us. Can I just add in? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Carrie Rocher. If we haven't uh, met already, I'm the new principal at West End Lake. Um, I just wanted to add in that we will be using the same platforms that you used in the past with kids with uh, Seesaw for the K2, K2 and then three through five uh, Google Classroom. So. We're going to plan to set those things up so that in the event that we do have quarantines or whole class quarantine, um, that would be in place and ready to go. So uh, that's part of our work at the beginning of the year with teachers. Um, and, and you guys are familiar with those platforms. So hopefully it will be pretty seamless should we hopefully not have to go there. Uh, 
All right, Brian, what's next? Right, we have a couple follow-up questions uh, for that topic, mainly for the high school. Um, is why why can't students like jump onto a virtual meet like they did last year? Is that going to be an option at all this year, or is that strictly like run through a, a Questar program if a student has to go into quarantine? So we uh, last year, you know, that's a good question. Last year we did have live streaming available in our classrooms, and you know the honest answer is we did live streaming last year because is it was what we thought was the best option at the time and i think it went well but what we've learned and this has been in multiple conversations obviously and a lot of thoughtful deliberation with both our faculty and our administrators that the quality of the instruction obviously for the person or the people in in person suffers a bit when the teacher is trying to teach to two different audiences so what we have really tried, and I mentioned kind of during the presentation, we're kind of pushing all of our chips in on the in-person learning, and we want to make the experience in person the best it can be. And we very consciously have decided that that means having our faculty focus on the in-person student and the in-person learner. Once you add that live streaming option, whether it's one kid or whether it's five kids or whether it's 20 kids, it really changes the dynamic of the instruction and it just can't be done as well. So it's not being uh, done uh, to punish kids who are quarantined. It's not being done because uh, you know it's too much work or it's not being done for any reason like that. It's being done because after a lot of thought and a lot of conversation with the people actually in the rooms performing the instruction and this administrative team that has been you know, very visible in the instructional side, that it just wasn't the best way to deliver instruction if possible. So. That's sort of a long-winded answer to it that we really feel like it's the best option for our students. I don't know, Heath, if you want to add anything to that or Matt, but. All right, uh, one of the, the major questions that we've gotten in the last few minutes is uh, symptoms that would send kids into, students into quarantine. Um, if a student has allergies with a runny nose, which is one of the symptoms for COVID, are they gonna be sent home? And then at that point, will they need a, a COVID test to return to school? We'll answer the second question first. Students who are uh, identified with having symptoms and are sent home are gonna need a COVID test, a negative test to return to school. That is uh, in the guidance and in the documentation that we have now. Uh, so similar to the past, that is that is the practice in place both for our students and our staff. I totally get it. I myself suffer from allergies. So you know, we're just asking people to be smart and be proactive. I, I think parents have a really good relationship with our school nurses to do a fantastic job. So stay in communication with them regarding your child and their symptoms. You know your child best, right? So I, what I kind of meant in the example I gave is they were symptoms that were allergy-like, but maybe not necessarily people who have allergies. So they didn't think much of it or thought oh, I might be having it. And again, it's no one's fault, right? We're all in the same boat and we're all trying to do the best we can. We're just saying if you're, if you're having symptoms that are COVID related potentially, they're out of the ordinary, you know, take the precaution um, and, and do it that way. Uh, but we do understand obviously that people have allergies and that's just a fact of life. So. Dr. Francini, can I just ask a follow up to that? Because last year, uh, at least at Miller Hill Sand Lake, I know that we had circumstances with children with you know, documented uh, allergy symptom, um, you know, conditions and so forth. And uh, so long as we got a, a note from the doctor saying, you know, this child is, is under my care for allergies, then they were okay. Is that still um, yep. okay? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. That's what I'm saying. I know our, our parents do a great job and our, our nurses do a great job. If, as long as you're, you're keeping that communication open, you know, we, we certainly can and will work with you. And we understand that. And that's a great point, Dennis. We know that that was the case in all of our buildings that people would send the notes to say, hey, you know, my kid has allergies. They're working with the doctor. So absolutely. One more quarantine question before we get on to another topic. Um, one, will students have to quarantine if someone at, in their home is exposed? And also, uh, if a student is quarantined, what type of tests do they need to come back? Can it be a rapid test or does it have to be, um, you know, the bigger PCR or whatever the, the bigger test is? Those are great questions. I'm not 100% sure of the answer to that. I, but I believe the answer is the test that you need to return cannot be a 
uh, one that is done at home. So it can't be a take home test. You know, I know you can go to CVS or Walgreens and buy them. Those are not acceptable. My understanding right now, and our nurses know more about this, and they're the ones that usually are involved in the front lines of this. My understanding is it has to be a test done somewhere outside of your home. I believe both the rapid and the PCR will both take care, will both check the box, but I'm not positive. Actually, I'm 99% sure that's correct. It just can't be at home. What was the first part, Brian? I think I got the second part again. I'm better with the second part of the question, not the first one. Uh, the first part was if someone at home is exposed, and I guess that can mean either they're positive or if they've just been exposed and they're a, a contact and they're sent into quarantine, will they have to stay home as well? So will a sibling have to stay home? Yeah, so I'm going to go with uh, the nurses know that answer better than I do as well. But I believe the answer is dependent on their vaccination status, right? So if the person is vaccinated, so if it's a, obviously a student who's 12 or older in our district, and they are vaccinated and they are asymptomatic, they come to school, right? Just like if it's a teacher and it's their own child who is exhibiting the symptoms and they are vaccinated and asymptomatic, they can come to work. I believe, don't quote me on this, that if they are not vaccinated and they're identified then as a contact, they will be quarantined. So that is my understanding. Um, and I'm 99% sure that's correct. A little bit fluid and keeps changing, but that is my understanding as of this moment. Okay, so moving into another area. What's being done to increase the ventilation and or air filtration in schools? The capital project would have addressed this issue, but it was voted down by the community. Great point. Um, I could put in a plug that we're gonna be having a capital project vote in October again. And that project is going to be focused on our needs and you'll be seeing communication uh, about that coming up. We have not really put much out there because we realize people A, are kind of in summer mode and B, their questions and their anxiety is more focused on the back to school and less about a capital project in October, which seems like it's a long ways away. It's not for us. And we've been working on that. And you're going to start seeing those communications actually uh, from Brian, who's on this, our moderator, uh, regarding the, the capital project. So in terms of the ventilation, you know, we were able to successfully run that last year and we'll be doing the same things. Some of the things I kind of mentioned earlier during the presentation, running the system before the school day, running it after the school day, opening windows, running the uh, air intakes. I don't think I mentioned this the first time, but the air intakes, you can control the amount of air that is coming in. We ran them at 100% as long as we possibly could. There is a point where it gets colder, you have to dial it back a little bit or else it'll freeze the components in the system. But we ran that at 100% for a very long time last year. I don't know offhand, our, our director of building and grounds uh, would obviously know that. So we're gonna continue to get that air pumping in and out, we can continue to open windows, open doors for the circulation, uh, and you know, as I said, change our filters often as possible, often as needed, change certainly um, filters anytime there's an exposure in a room and, and just kind of continue to do things that we did last year. We felt like we were pretty successful in terms of the ventilation component of our plan. So is there enough space in each school cafeteria to keep children spaced three feet apart? Uh, Miller Hill Sand Lake specifically was targeted in the capital project uh, to improve on its space. Uh, do we want the buildings take care of that one? Heath, do you want to start? Sure, I can absolutely do that. Um, so actually, our, our plan at, uh, for, for food and for lunchtime at the high school um, really does focus in on that whole concept of kind of layered mitigation strategies. Um, we are going to use three different locations to serve lunch at the high school in order to make sure that our students are able to be um, three feet apart. So we'll be doing lunch this year in our cafeteria, in our LGI, and also in room 101, which is adjacent to the cafeteria. Um, again, we're going to be keeping students three feet apart using all of those spaces. Um, we're going to certainly be making sure that we're reducing the amount of time that students um, have their masks off, which we think is going to be a critical component of this as well. 
and we are working to set up outdoor eating options um, just adjacent to each of those areas. So in addition, we'll have outdoor seating um, just outside of the LGI, outside of the cafeteria on the grass um, on the other side of those windows. And we are looking also to um, make our citizenship courtyard space available to students. Um, so we'll be using a number of different spaces, including outdoor spaces, to make sure that we can feed all of our students safely and with the appropriate distancing. Thanks, Heath. Rob, do you want to go and then we'll go right to the uh, elementary folks? Sure thing. Yeah. At Algonquin last year, one of the benefits of this uh, new experience for all of us this past year was to have outdoor lunch every day. And so our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders had grade level lunches outside every day that it was above 50 degrees and dry. And uh, it was a lot of fun and a great success. We plan to do that again this year. Our cafeteria is ready. Uh, well, it will be in a few days once we have the floor installed after the flood. So we'll have the cafeteria. Our collaborative learning center is going to be another quiet space for students to use. That was another benefit uh, from the program last year that we're keeping this year. And then our cafeteria hallway has some nice furniture as well, some relaxing kind of chairs and setup like that. So again, some different spaces for our students to use um, depending on the weather that day. I can go first to the elementary level. Uh, uh, I just, I, I'd like to start by, by saying uh, the cafeteria at Costa Rica won't be classrooms this year. Uh, so uh, we are pretty excited about that. Uh, we've gone through a, a variety of options at Costa Rica for how to best uh, accommodate students and safety um, and the, the layered mitigation strategies. Um, as a result, uh, we are going to actually continue keeping uh, the cafeteria is split into two separate rooms using the uh, foldable wall extended. Um, that way we can have grade levels in each section of that. So we're separating grade levels. Um, even with that, we're able to uh, meet the uh, spacing requirements. Um, and we're also, uh, we've also built in some time between class periods, between grade levels, so that the air can kind of filter out and, and kind of get cleansed. Uh, prior to the next group going in. Um, and again, at the elementary level, we, we are working with our staff. Uh, we will be next week, certainly, uh, to uh, have students once completing their, their lunch uh, to put their masks back on um, in order to be able to, to limit that time of exposure uh, while, while still understanding that we have elementary students um, and just trying to, again, limit uh, that exposure. So. And we'll continue to be flexible and, and responsive to needs that arise over the course of the year. All right, judging by Carrie and Dennis's uh, silence, I believe that answer. Uh, I could just add in um, that at West Sand Lake, we will not be mixing grade levels for lunch. Um, we will have one grade level at a time. The students will have assigned seats uh, with their class um, and we'll work on, you know, helping kids to have some choice in that so they're not just assigned to random seats, but um, we just want to make sure we're keeping track for contact tracing purposes. Uh, and then we shortened our lunch a little bit, uh, about, about five minutes uh, to a 25 minute lunch so that um, we could essentially expand the lunch times a little bit throughout the day. So we're actually starting lunch at 1050 and the last lunch ends at 120 so that each grade level could have their own lunch time and there's no mixing between grade levels. Um, we have enough space and lunch tables to do it. Uh, so we feel good about that. And the extra five minutes that they're losing in their lunch time is going towards recess. So they'll be happy to get a little bit more time outside to play. And we'll definitely do all those other layered approaches that um, Mr. Gellis spoke about with disinfecting and, and um, masking. And finally, uh, being as Miller Hill Sand Lake was specifically mentioned, um, and the need is still there for a larger cafeteria space. I'm not sure if it's going to be part of the new um, vote, but. Uh, in any case, uh, I echo what my colleagues said in terms of the mitigation that we're putting in place. Um, at Miller Hill Sand Lake in, in years past, we did combine grade levels uh, during portions of lunch. We will not be doing that this year. 
uh, as Mrs. Rocher uh, just alluded to. Um, we have expanded the, the lunch block of time, uh, reduced the individual grade levels, but in terms of the, the duration of time during the school day that we serve lunch so that we can accommodate a single grade level uh, in the cafeteria uh, during each lunch block. Again, as Mr. Gella uh, mentioned, appropriately physically spaced. Um, so the, the schedule works, it's just uh, taking up a, more of the day. Thank you. I'm uh, just communicating with our nurses um, and I wanted to, to kind of go back to the, the uh, quarantine question. Uh, it is important to mention again that we quarantine based on what DOH tells us to, that the district itself does not do the quarantining. So if the DOH states that all members in the family have to quarantine, do an exposure, then we have to follow that. We can't supersede uh, their directive. So uh, usually we get a daily update from the DOH regarding outside contacts and exposures outside of the district, as well as obviously you know what's happening in our home building, so. so. What type of daily cleaning and sanitizing will be done in each of the schools, uh, notably secondary schools where students are changing classes? I'll let Heath and Rob maybe talk a little bit about that, but something I, I, I guess kind of globally speaking, one thing that we have learned and uh, you know, the science is telling us, the data is telling us, is that the virus is not transmitted as much on um, surfaces, right? It's more of an aerosol type of spread. So we're gonna continue doing our sanitizing daily. Uh, we're gonna focus on high touch areas. Uh, I actually just talked with our supervisor for building grounds uh, this week about it, actually we met and we were reviewing that. So you know, we're gonna focus on those high touch areas and they'll get cleaned throughout the day uh, more often than the regular classroom. But really for the classrooms, it's going to be once a day, and even in transportation, it is now, I believe, once a day, whereas before the guidance was twice a day for the cleaning, I believe it's once a day. And again, that's just based on the fact, the guidance is based on the fact that it's it's not spreading uh, through through that. So I don't know if Rob or Heath have any questions. Or any comments? I would support what you said, Dr. Francina. I know at the high school, like you had said, we we typically do those high touch areas, you know, several at several points during the day with one of our daytime custodians who will move through the building and, you know, just make sure that we're disinfecting doorknobs and areas that people touch on a regular basis. Um, and of course, we're going to continue to provide students with hand washing opportunities and, you know, hand sanitizer so that we can kind of put all of these strategies together to keep things clean and safe. I think that's a great point about hand sanitizing and washing hands because there may be more common equipment that's used this coming school year, especially in science classes and things like that. And so we'll be encouraging hand washing and hand sanitizing before using anything that may be used in common with other students. So will lockers be used at the middle school and high school? Um, will they be spaced apart? And also will they be used in classrooms at the elementary level? Um, at the high question that I'll gladly turn over. Why don't we start at the elementary this time? I saw Heath jumping in. Well, we'll go the other way. Uh, elementary, what are your thoughts on that? And then we'll go up to Rob and Heath. Uh, yeah, I think at the elementary level, um, the, the cubby spaces uh, where students typically house uh, their belongings, their coats and snow pants and book bags and all of that. Uh, last year, actually, teachers uh, worked really hard to be able to come up with uh, protocols and procedures where students could still utilize those spaces um, while physically distanced. And I, it's um, our goal that we're able to continue that again this year and utilize that space uh, for students to be able to house their belongings um, while still, uh, you know, meeting the requirements that, that we're asked to meet um, and still do it in a safe way. At the middle school, we're not gonna start the year using lockers. Last year, we, students used backpacks to carry their things from class to class, and that worked well for us. It creates more space in the hallway by not having students at lockers. Um, it makes an even uh, easier flow of traffic in the hallway as well. And so we've decided to start off the year by not using lockers. However, we will be assigning every student a locker. They won't know which one it is just yet, but we will figure one out for them. And we'll have a plan so that perhaps later on in the school year, we're able to utilize our lockers the way we have in the past. 
And we are going to, uh, to this year move into providing students, um, all students at the high school, once again, with the opportunity to use a locker. Um, you'll notice in your school tool account, as we get a little bit closer to the opening, that um, each student's locker and uh, combination information will appear in there a couple of days before opening. Um, we've actually found at the high school over the years, however, that very few students use them. So we don't expect the impact of that usage to be tremendous um, you know, in our transitions and whatnot, but we are going to offer them to students again uh, because we have them available and we're able to do so. I have a couple questions for uh, athletics. So we'll, there be a limit on spectators at athletic events and or at other schools in the in the suburban council. I'll uh, I'll start off and then and give it to Mark after that. Right now, again, kind of going back to what I said, we're trying to make this year as normal as possible. So, in my opinion, at this point, we are going to open up spectators for our outside games uh, as much as possible. Indoor, I think, is still a little bit of a question because we have volleyball inside. I don't think that's really been determined as much. So I would say spectators, yes. I just don't know if we'll have more of a limit. And Mark is um, in constant meetings with the athletic directors in the Suburban Council and the Capital District. So I'll let him comment if I was correct and then what he's hearing from our colleagues in other districts. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Frangini. Um, last week's meetings in the Suburban Council were really – um, focused on getting kids on the field and what precautions we were taking uh, for this week uh, just to get those kids on the field for practices. Uh, our meetings uh, starting next week, uh, we'll be talking about spectators. Um, as far as I know, and it seems like the consensus right now is um, outdoors for the most part, there's not going to be any limits within the Suburban Council. Uh, some of the school, the bigger class AA schools that draw a lot of spectators, such as Shenandoah, they draw like 5,000 people for football games. They're going to put a little limit on that. Um, and there may be a few schools that limit the amount of indoor spectators for volleyball, but no official word on that just yet. We're sticking with athletics, uh, will athletes use locker rooms this year? And also, will students uh, be changing for gym? So our student athletes, they will be, and they already have been using the locker rooms. Yes, uh, they're masked up, um, asked to stay three feet away from each other and uh, just get in and out and do what they need to do. The, the, the locker room this year is not a place to socialize or anything like that. It's a place to get changed and get out of there. Uh, that's really what we're reinforcing with our student athletes. Um, and for phys ed, um, I, I, I'm going to turn this over to Rob for the middle school. Uh, for the high school and talking to our PE teachers, um, the locker room will be open for students to change, but we will be flexible um, if a student uh, does not want to use the locker room or doesn't feel safe going into change in there uh, due to COVID, we'll be flexible with that. And at the middle school, we're not planning on using uh, the locker room to start the school year. All right, so the last, I think, athletic-oriented question that we have is, as the Pfizer vaccine has become, it's received its full approval, and some schools in the area are requiring students in uh, high-risk sports to be vaccinated, will Averill Park be following suit and requiring students to be fully vaccinated to compete in those high-risk sports? Sorry about that, my light went off again. Um, so the question regarding will we require vaccination? Again, we're gonna wait and see what directives come from the governor and what is done by the legislature in terms of vaccination requirements at this point. Uh, we, we did talk about uh, quite extensively whether or not we were gonna require um, vaccinations for the fall athletes. And because of the late approval, because of the late guidance, we just didn't feel like it was fair to student athletes who uh, may have wanted to and didn't yet, and they'd be excluded from it, which is why we put in the testing program so that our, our students are all testing. And we made that uh, a requirement for participation. Do we know what percentage of staff and students have been vaccinated? 
We do not. We asked our, our staff to voluntarily let us know, and many of them have provided that information to our human resources department. We have that on file for uh, contact tracing purposes. And, uh, you know, certainly as more people have gotten vaccinated, more people tell us more informally. Uh, so we don't have an official account of that right now. And in terms of our students, no, we don't. Um, so, no. I have a question on uh, proper wearing of uh, face covering. Masks will be required to be worn over the mouth and the nose. How will that be enforced? Uh, so correct that the correct use is over mouth and nose. And I'll let the principals jump in and if I uh, say this incorrectly, but we consider the proper use of mask wearing to just be like any other uh, school rule, um, school protocol, school practice. So you're asked to do something and you know, we ask our students to comply with the rules. And if they don't do that, then you get into our code of conduct, uh, whether it's running in the hallway or whether it's pushing someone or whether it's fighting or whatever those categories are. In this case, you know, you ask someone to do something, they don't do it, then you're talking about maybe insubordination or not just following the rules. So that's how we've done it. Uh, I don't know if the principal has anything to add. Certainly, I, I will say this, and again, the principals know much more about this than I do. The number of, I, if we go back to a year ago, I think we were all kind of worried about kids and mask wearing. You know, high school kids don't listen and elementary kids are too young. And I was at Algonquin for many years, like, oh, middle school kids. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, our students were unbelievable last year in terms of their wearing of bass, um, uh, unbelievably um, compliant and rule following and on board with the protocols that were in place. Um, I, I see some nodding. Principals, anything you want to add, feel free. Yeah, Dr. Franchi, I, I just want to say that the, the kids were amazing last year. And, you know, sure, there were times when they might need a gentle reminder. Uh, and that's pretty much what it came down to. Um, and, and again, I just can't praise the kids enough for how they uh, handled last year. It really became a non-issue. Um, so I don't foresee it being a problem. A couple questions uh, about where the, the science is coming from in terms of the three feet rule and things like that. And is that coming from the CDC and those other uh, organizations that were mentioned in the plan? Yeah, we're following the guidance from you know the, the, org the resources that are labeled or uh, referenced, excuse me, in the plan. You know, the American Pediatrics Association, the CDC, uh, the guidance document from SED. So we're just kind of following uh, what we're being told is the, the best practice. We have a question for the middle school. Uh, will backpacks on wheels be allowed? Yes, they will. Yep, that, it's a great thing to have. If you have one, you can use it, no problem. And is the district doing anything to address uh, before and after care for families? Um, GCC has told a couple parents apparently that they are booked up and there's a waiting list. So is there uh, other avenues So that, that is a, an issue that just came to my attention at least um, a few hours ago. I've been in contact with GCC. Uh, GCC has been in our district for a very long time and has been a great partner for us. And uh, we appreciate all they do. Uh, they really came through for us during this pandemic in terms of providing opportunities for our students to have you know care during the day. So I do know in, in communicating with them today that they are facing a, a shortage of uh, providers similar to I think a lot of employers right now, that labor crisis is sort of all over the place. It's my understanding that they are not, um, they, they don't see it as being a long-term issue. They have students on a wait list and they're working very aggressively to hire folks, advertise, get them on board, and that their hope and their plan is that wait list will go away sooner rather than later. But they, from my understanding, wanted to communicate with parents as upfront and as early as possible so parents were not left uh, with a last minute you know, notification that there was no childcare option for them. So we're working closely with GCC to support them. Um, and again, we view them as a strong partner, a long-term partner here in the district and we'll continue to do that and explore what we can do. So if homeschooling is uh, chosen by a family 
and they want to return to in school because they're vaccinated at that point, what will that uh, transition be like? Uh, Dr. Franchi, I don't know if you, you heard that, but I will take the question because uh, I'm sure you would have tossed it my way anyways. Uh, if you nice. are, sorry, huh? oh. if you are, um, if you elected to homeschool, um, you do have the option to return um, at a point in which your child was vaccinated. Uh, we would treat a homeschool student similar to a new student. We would do uh, you know, what we could to catch them up. Obviously a homeschool curriculum is not the same as what we provide in, in person. Um, but uh, we, you know, there's certainly expectations of a child when they are homeschooled to at least be following the same standards um, that New York State requires of us in school. So uh, hopefully the, the transition will be relatively seamless. Um, we, we have dealt with it prior to pandemics, um, bringing homeschool students back. So we would welcome them when uh, you certainly feel that they are um, uh, able to, to return to us. Thanks, Matt. I uh, heard most of that question. It froze right around the time, Brian. So thank you for jumping in there. I think I'm back on now. I shut my video down for a second. There's a question about uh, medical eligibility uh, to be, I guess, to go into the Questar program. Is there a set, set of rules to be deemed medically eligible to go into that program? So uh, a couple of things that we have, you know, sent that survey out. And the reason we had to do that so early is as you would imagine for whether it's the program at a cap region or program at Questar, they have to staff up for that. So they needed commitment numbers. So they were looking for like a, a general estimate then a more specific uh, commitment in terms of numbers. So we had to get that going earlier. The commitment we've asked for for students has been for a year, similar to any other BOCES program or any other program we offer, whether it's Tech Valley or our CTE programs. Uh, so very consistent that we're asking for a one year uh, commitment in that regard. Um, in terms of I think the question was dealt more with homeschooling and can you return? If you're homeschooled and then for whatever reason you decide to return, yes, we would bring you back into the district. I think, I'm sorry, that was the medical note is what you were getting at this one though, right? Right. If you're medically eligible, what, what how are you considered med medically eligible to go into a Questar program? Okay, my fault, sorry about that. Yeah, for the medical note, we have been um, just asking for a note from any physician, you know, obviously it's usually your pediatrician or your family doctor um, stating the cause for why you or your student is not uh, able to come in to the in-person learning. We've left it uh, intentionally very wide open, to be honest, and we didn't want to get into a situation where we were judging or valuing people's decisions or the uh, recommendation of a, of a physician. So we very purposely left that open-ended and uh, wanted to make sure that people who had a justifiable reason that a doctor was willing to sign their name to that we would accept it. So this week we've had a few uh, issues with the bus routes and we put out a communication stating that there's gonna be some changes. Uh, when will the new bus routes be released? Yeah, there was a, an issue where the information that was uploaded into uh, our school management system was the wrong information. I, I believe that the bus information is coming out tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't remember offhand though. And then I know the big thing is we're going to do the, um, the dry runs like we always do. And that we're really encouraging parents to pay attention to when the bus comes at that point, And then we'll have the information out there. But uh, look for that information coming out. Um, I know I was just reviewing something our transportation put out. And Brian, you'll be putting it out tomorrow, uh, the draft of it regarding some of the upcoming transportation information. So it's coming soon and you'll have it soon. Sticking with transportation for a minute, um, if somebody's ex exposed to COVID-19 on a bus, now the buses are at full capacity, will the whole bus be uh, put into quarantine at that point? I don't know. It, it all depends on um, a lot of factors. 
there's obviously the length of the bus ride. There is how packed is that bus in particular? How long is distance? You know, are students properly wearing their masks? Uh, that came up in our DOH call. You know, the guidance actually uh, it refers to the proper use of mask wearing. So that's something that we'll be enforcing. So if students are wearing their masks, if they're um, on the bus for certain amount of time, where the windows open, where the roof hatch is open, all those things will go into that, um, which is why the contact tracing is, is extremely labor intensive, both for the folks on this call, um, as well as our nurses, uh, our other supervisors, like our transportation supervisor, and certainly for our Department of Health. Um, you know, they go through each case individually and in detail to determine. I can tell you after being part of these way too many times, they, they don't take it lightly. It's not something that's done um, quickly and sort of knee jerk in reaction. It is very well thought out and they try to be consistent, but they also try to be responsive to what they're seeing in the Department of Health in terms of trends and patterns and how the disease of the virus is spreading and all those things. So a very open ended answer because um, it's very specific and time, you know, point in time and in nature. So a few uh, questions on homeschooling. Can they participate in school events, whether it's uh, your after school programs or your sports or anything like that? Also, will they receive a diploma from Avril Park or will they get one from you know, Questar if they're doing the Questar program? Matt, do you wanna take that homeschooling one? Sure. Um, th there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, yeses and nos with homeschooling. Um, so there's there is a lot of different things to cover. I could tell you that um, extracurriculars would be would be a possibility, but interscholastic sports are not. If you're homeschooled, um, you cannot receive a diploma in New York State for a homeschooled student um, that that finishes uh, in a homeschool environment. Um, just to point out that the Questar program is not the same as a homeschool program. That is a, a remote program uh, offered uh, by a, a, an organization that is still connected to the, the New York State Department of Education. So it is, a, it is a, a viable way to continue your coursework and still be on a pathway to graduate with a diploma uh, from a high school in New York. So BOCES and homeschool are very different. Uh, homeschool is really on your own. Uh, so therefore, there, there would not be a diploma in that situation. With all these protocols, do we foresee anything changing in terms of mask wearing uh, and things like that if cases go down and if COVID kind of washes out midway through the year? That's a great question. So some of our neighboring districts, actually the ones in the cap region VOCES, uh, developed a chart and the chart was very, um, uh, very systemic in terms of how it was developed. They had the different levels of transmission and they had a bunch of categories on the left. And if you were in this level, then you had this. And if you're in this level, you had this. And that was one way to approach this. We decided not to do that. Uh, the other schools in our county that are in the suburban council, which is East Greenbush and Troy, also decided not to do that because we thought it was a little too prescriptive and uh, just decided it was better to have that flexibility. And that's why we put a note in our plan that basically says, this is a point in time document. We are constantly reviewing the information that's out there from DOH, from our school community to see what the transmission levels are. And it is our sincere hope that as positivity rates hopefully come down, as the more people get vaccinated, um, you know, seen and heard some stuff about Delta variant uh, plateauing. You know, if all those things happen and we have positive developments, we are certainly uh, be more than willing to open things up a little bit and, and, and give our kids more options and more freedoms. Uh, if you look even from how we ended last year, where we were kind of in, in June and how the guidance changed really for summer school. And at that point it was very different. And then all of a sudden again, in August it changed and kind of went back to the end of the school year type. So it, it's constantly changing and evolving. So in our minds, yes, we will certainly be looking to uh, evaluate and uh, relax some of the, the, uh, protocols that we have in place. I think the last uh, big question that can kind of go across the board is what will pick up and drop off look like? Will it be the same as last year or will there be changes to how students are coming and going? Pick up and drop off. 
I'll stall for a second to give everyone a chance to uh, come up with their answer. We're, we're going to start with Rob this time. Middle school always gets to go second. Rob, you can hit lead off. Great. Well, uh, pick up and drop off has been a lot smoother after improvements have been made to the campus uh, entryway. Uh, Dr. Franchini worked very hard with the Department of uh, Transportation uh, that worked to improve our entrance and our traffic flow. And so we are uh, in good shape for that. It worked out really well last year. Families can enter and wait in the Papa parking lot. Uh, and we have some information that's going to be shared out with an actual um, about this particular topic coming up soon this uh, coming week. But parents can come in, pull into the Papa parking lot, wait uh, for their child to come out, uh, follow the line for the parent uh, pickup, uh, drop off area. Uh, or as well, uh, after the buses have left the campus, go ahead and move up to the front of the building and have a reunification point with your child uh, in front of any of the parts of the sidewalk. We do ask that students remain on the sidewalk for their safety, so that they're not walking in the middle of the pavement area. So staying on the sidewalk is safe, and we ask parents to pull up next to where their child will be each day. All right, thanks, Rob. Elementary. What do you got? We'll start with Carrie over there at West Sand Lake. Um, I think I can probably speak for most of us here. I think we have a very similar plan. Um, we're going to use the driveline system again for, um, for pick up and drop off, although you don't need it for um, drop off in the morning. Uh, we're not doing the health screening, so it'll be a little bit quicker in that respect. Um, but same loop, at least for West Sand Lake, um, and obviously buses coming in at the same time, we're going to have staff out there to help escort students across into the building. Um, and then for pickup, um, we, we are going to be pushing it back a little bit um, to get closer to a, a true end of day dismissal at 325, which is contractually what um, we have in it for teachers. So we're pushing it back a little bit. We know we can do it uh, based on how things went last year um, with getting kids out quickly using the driveline code system. You'll get your codes from um, your teachers on the, at least from West Sand Lake, we're going to be sending them home on the first day. Um, and then, you know, we display your code in your car, we punch it in, it goes up on the board in the classroom and the kids come down in a pretty organized fashion. And it's a really a system that has worked well for us. Um, and then of course, dismissal onto the bus as normal and hopefully getting out of here pretty quickly. I don't know if any of the other elementary buildings have a different plan. Yeah, so at Miller Hill Sand Lake, we are also gonna to continue to use the driveline uh, system. Um, and I saw a question that just came up that, yes, we did start dismissal at 310 last year, and we do plan on starting it at 325, uh, which is the normal, typical end of the student day. Uh, so we do plan on beginning dismissal procedures at 325. Uh, in regards to Miller Hill Sand Lake specifically, uh, the morning drop off will be the same, although, as Mrs. Rozier uh, alluded to, we won't be doing we won't be needing to do the temperature checks. Uh, so we will be utilizing the second entrance in the front of the building by the cafeteria to allow students to come in. So I anticipate that the drop off in the morning will actually go a little bit quicker uh, because we'll be able to utilize two entrances into the building instead of the single one by the main entrance. In regards to dismissal at Miller Hill Sand Lake, uh, it, it may look a little bit different uh, this year um, as opposed to, to last year when we had parents remain in their vehicle and we brought the children uh, out there. Obviously with the location of our school and the limited uh, access we have, a lot of the traffic did get backed up onto Route 66 uh, and, and we're gonna try and mitigate that uh, as best as possible. So uh, we're currently in the process of working out the logistics to see if uh, we can have parents park and actually come to the building as they would have done in the past. Again, we'd still utilize the driveline system uh, in terms of getting the children down from their classroom. Uh, but um, my plan anyway, and I believe all of our plans is to be communicating with, with our families uh, probably next week about some of the finalized plans for each of our individual buildings. And certainly uh, student drop off and pick up uh, will be part of that conversation. So um, parents, if you can just be a little, little bit, continue to be a little bit more patient, uh, we'll, we'll be getting that information out to you uh, certainly before the start of school, but probably sometime next week.
He's, yep, go ahead. I, oh, sorry. I, I was actually literally going to turn my time over to Heath because otherwise you'd just listen to me say the same thing as Mr. Simpson and Mrs. Rocha. There you go. Heath. All right, thank you. For the high school, our drop up and uh, drop off and pick up is going to be the same as it's been uh, for the past several years. So for parents, you're going to um, drop off and pick up your students in the uh, loop around the small parking lot that is right in front of the um, the greenhouse uh, at the high school. And you know our objective is always to kind of keep three zones of traffic. So that uh, small parking lot in front is going to be in front of the. Um, the greenhouse is going to be the area for uh, parents uh, to do drop off and pick up. We like to keep our student drivers and student traffic uh, in the front of the building directly in that parking lot, which we kind of reserve for students and, and, and younger drivers. And we keep our buses uh, off to the other side by the atrium and the athletic um, area. So we'll have our front doors open as well as the music wing doors for bad weather. Um, so we do pick up and drop off in those same locations there and it will look very similar to last year. We have uh, blown past our one hour allotment of time for tonight. Uh, we did have one last question of how many people were on this uh, webinar. It topped out around 140. Um, and we thank all 140 of you for, for coming and listening to this presentation. Well, thank you. Um, you know, thank you, as you said, Brian, to the people who uh, joined us tonight. Thank you to the admin team uh, for their uh, time and expertise. We again ask for uh, patience and flexibility. This is a very fluid situation. Uh, there's been a lot of work. I can assure you that the amount of time and effort that this group has put in has been uh, pretty extensive. There's a lot going on um, in any given summer, but you throw the reopening or back to school plan in, and of course the flood at the middle school and the high school and the very significant damage there. Uh, the flood plus COVID plus a regular summer, uh, it's been pretty um, uh, pretty exhausting, I think. So I appreciate the folks in this call uh, doing this and um, answering questions. So we will continue to keep you updated. Uh, our next step in this process is the Board of Education meeting on Monday. Basically the same type of information will be shared, assuming there's no new changes. We'll keep an eye out for what the governor has in terms of mandate changes or in terms of uh, requirements, and we'll continue to be flexible and do what we can. Our number one goal, of course, is safety and health of our students and our staff, and we will continue to emphasize that and prioritize that. And we realize that that includes the social emotional component, which means having our kids here and providing them with opportunities and activities as we do work to fulfill our mission of meeting the needs of and creating opportunities for every student every day. So thank you very much and have a great evening.